118, what is the function of trust? I am Kathleen Wiley, a Jungian psychoanalyst in North Carolina, and I am here with Deborah Henson Conant, a composer, a mentor, a coach, um, an artist, and a great, great creative. We both play the harp, and that's why we call this Jung at Harp. Every week, DHC and I come together with a question that we're both exploring. And we don't show up with the answers and have a script to tell you, but we show up with a question that we invite you to join in through the chat to offer your thoughts about and musings about. And usually by the end of the 30 minutes or so that we talk, we have some greater clarity and some action point for ourselves about the question, and hopefully that happens with you. So. Um, Deborah, do you want to talk about how we decided on trust today? Yeah, yeah. There's a reason that 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 I had this question. Um, I'm I have just released a musical called The Golden Cage, and I'm doing a lot of unlocking of the ideas inside it. It's an allegory uh, about freedom and security. And there's something that happens in the second half of the show where one person shoves another person off a cliff and then the other person transforms. And, um, and it's, it's some, it can be disturbing for, for people uh, like, what, how, do, how, how can you get away with that? You know, and, and so I had a discussion after the premiere in which people were saying, I don't like him because of blah, blah, blah. And so I went back to look at why, why did this happen? How did somebody do something that was so maybe uncharacteristic of them? Mm -hmm. um, and when I looked back, I noticed that there's this moment in the middle of the show where everything slips away and these two characters are singing almost like a Gregorian chant. And they're speaking all my life, all my life, I've waited for this moment of belief and trust. Mm -hmm. And it's a moment out of time. And I realized that that is the moment that defines everything that happens after it. That when we do, or when these characters have this split second of trust, everything that happens after is inevitable and unimportant. Mm -hmm. She is going to transform and, and be free of where she has been trapped. And he is going to be free of his obsession with finding this cage. Those two things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. And they're going to happen in maybe the fastest way that they could, which is why things happen that you wouldn't expect. But it all comes from this moment of trust. The split, and I, I got mm -hmm. that it's a split second it, it, that it shifts. It's not like it has to be there for uh, five hours or it has to be developed or blah, 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 blah. That split second of trust changes everything that happens mm -hmm. afterwards. So I came to you asking about that. What is the function of trust and how could it do that? And then you started talking to me <laughs> about these great things like Eric Erickson or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Eric Erickson was a psychoanalyst who looked at um, how, what happens in relationship to other people and the environment that forges a strong relationship with oneself. And he says that the developmental task of birth through the age of two is trust versus mistrust. So that the infant who has, if the mother's healthy, has been in the womb, that's the good enough womb and the good enough mother and the mother's healthy so the baby gets nourished, suddenly comes out of the womb where everything isn't automatically available and that their first experience and how they're cared for sets up a bodily experience that thus extends into the emotional, mental, psychological, spiritual of whether or not the world is safe and they're safe, whether they can trust the environment, other people to give what they need. And so trust is essential for our ability to live freely and move towards that which we want relationally. Now, in, in the musical, and of course, from a Jungian perspective, both Althea and Boris represent characters in our own psyche. And, you know, Jung says that our psyche is a multiplicity of parts, you know, that we're a complex of opposites, that there are many, many, if, if we want to call them subpersonalities, I like to call them feedback loops, that operate inside of us. And that there's also a larger self that holds it mm. all together, that can hold it all. 
And let me just say for people listening and yeah. watching that these two, the two characters in this particular musical came out of a question, is my life going to be about security or freedom? And it's sort of fragmented and, and they be, that became A and B and then that became Alpha and Beta, which became Althea and Boris. And so they represent the part of us that is trapped in, you know, in, in the fear of being out. And then another part of us that is almost sort of tra trapped in the ambition of finding something. So right. it's, and, and it, and what happens through the play, and it's not like I knew this in advance, it's just how the play played out. Um, th they are able to release each other from right. their obsession and also their isolation. So um, anyway, back to you, Kathleen, just to kind of explain this fragmentation that I think happens in us and that and that is and that's played out in the play absolutely i mean it, it, we all <laughs> i mean we all experience this pair of opposites in us all day long you know if it's as simple as the part of me that wants to go to the gym because it helps me feel better and be healthy and another part of me that just wants to be a slug and stay home and you know lay on the couch have a glass of wine do whatever i mean you know? well, so well, this I plays to... out in in many many ways so i want to go back to trust because um I and I'd love to come to this example actually and ask what would how how might trust function in this particular example you said and then I also want to ask like in my childhood my parents split up when I was really little and it was a, it was a you know there was issues there and um violence and and then I was sent off to live with this relative and then sent off to live you know so I'm realizing and this I'm sure things like this happen to mm -hmm. many people um so that I'm thinking when you said, you know, that trust by two and I'm thinking, well, by by two, I was like totally not trusting. So my big question, which which I would like you to answer in the next 15 minutes is <laughs> how do how do we get that trust? How do we develop that trust if we don't have it? So um, to those two things, uh, I forgot the first question, but. Yeah, I you know. I mean, that's that's a that's an important question. And the. Um, the answer, although it may, it can seem simple, really isn't simple. What has to happen is one has to begin to have experiences where one does realize there are people who are trustworthy, one can trust oneself. And yeah, maybe there are people who aren't trustworthy. And maybe sometimes we can't trust ourselves. We do things that are not ultimately will hurt us. But ultimately, it is about getting in connection with all of those energies, just like in the in the musical Althea mm -hmm. and Boris getting connection mm -hmm. and realizing each has something to offer that's valid. You know, the part of me that might want to hang out and just chill on the couch or have a glass of wine is valid. Maybe I'm tired. Maybe I've been running all week. Maybe I need chill time. Mm -hmm. And the part of me that wants to go to the gym is valid. And if those two can meet and be in dialogue and trust the validity of the other, then what Jung called the transcendent function can happen, a uniting third, a third way, the moment of transformation can happen. And it just so happens in the musical, that moment of transformation involves the two working together. In a way, Althea surrenders to Boris and Boris surrenders to Althea. Althea says, push me. And right. Boris is like, I can't push you, but he does. And in a way, but, and, and then he has this moment of what happened? Did I push her? Did she fly? Did she die? Mm -hmm. Because when those two opposites in our nature meet, it's not always obvious to us consciously that something new has been born that's actually healthy. I mean, we're often operating in the dark, just like, and, and so trusting that there is a larger self, that there is this function of the, the, the transcendent function, that there is an organic drive within us for wholeness is part of what we have to trust in order to surrender. Well, I, it's funny because it, um, it's, I almost feel like it is the trust itself that transforms things. Mm -hmm. Because and and you said this about surrendering because it's not like they trust each other and then they change and they're better people. No, they trust each other and then they're even more obnoxious. He, <laughs> he, I mean, he he lies, but I but that's what that's what I went back to look at. Like they don't change; they're the same and worse. Mm. But that moment of trust has changed everything, 
And that moment of trust and, and what you said, the trust allows them to surrender. And I think that is in fact, you know, because it's not like they are acting on each other. They are. But it's almost like if you look at the show again, the trust, the tr that split second of trust is it, nothing matters after that. The surrender will happen. The transformation will happen. I mean, it, it does matter, but it, but it doesn't matter. They're going to do what they do. And then if they have that trust, it is going, they are going to transform. That's what blows my mind. Uh -huh. Well, if we go back to Erickson's model, the, the first stage of development is trust and everything else builds on that. Or right. it's mistrust and, if, and, if, and everything else builds right. up. Right. So, I mean, we exactly. can make it, you know, so in that regard, what you're saying makes makes sense. You know, as a, as a good Jungian, I'm going to always see more of the complexity and the new. <laughs> right. you know, but well, but. Well, let me ask you something. So you're saying if if we, if between ages of zero and, or, or like whatever it is, like, I, what, okay, between birth and two, we're either developing trust or mistrust. If we develop mistrust and and then later in life, I, I'm just wondering if later in life, if trust happens, is it almost like it goes back and it, everything changes? It's almost like the trust you develop here at, you know, 65 literally shifts that trust that you, that mistrust that you developed at two. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer the question this way. We can never change our history. But what the moment of trust does in this moment is it changes our relationship to our history, which thus changes how we feel and are able to move and live in this moment. Yeah, well, yeah. I yeah. mean, so one of the one of the promises in twelve step recovery is that we will not regret the past, nor wish mm -hmm. to turn our backs upon it. And it's and that's just fascinating to me. And I was talking mm -hmm. to a friend the other day, and he was like, you know, do you regret the past? And I, and I realized, well, that that has completely changed in my mm -hmm. life. Nothing yeah. has changed in the past. Right. But That's I right. experience it, and and I, you know, there's things I want to make amends for, but you know that it it that has changed, and I have it yeah. that that changed for Alfia and Boris. They were anyway. Go on. Well, their their relationship. I mean, your relate our relationship to the past changes. Um, you know, it's interesting to think about do Boris and Alfia change, um, or do they continue in spite of the moment of trust to be the same people they were. And a friend of mine used to always say that she and her colleagues used to muse about if someone's in analysis and they come into analysis a smuck, do they leave analysis being a smuck? I mean, you know, it's like, do people really change? Do, 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 you know, tigers change their stripes kind of question or spots or whatever? I mean, I, you know, I think that part of what we realize, and I think this is how I experienced um, Althea and Boris is to me there seems to be a recognition at the end that both things are needed that what's needed is the golden cage but the ability to come and go freely from within the golden cage and that what's needed is the ability to fly and to explore and to go different places that they're both needed it's not one or the other but the problem is and and i love the moment at the end when althea comes to back to get boris who's now locked himself in the cage she says so that's how it happens you lock yourself in from the inside right, right. and to me that is probably one of the biggest kernels of psychological wisdom <laughs> and and the play or in the musical, because we do need a home that feels golden to us, that, yes. that feels secure, where we can trust, where we feel safe. But if we lock ourselves into that and experience nothing outside of it, we don't take the risk and sometimes let life shove us, so to speak, into a new experience, then we start to die. Mm. You know, so to me, it seems like there is, in a way, what we have at the end is Althea and Boris stand together holding hands on stage as if they're flying together. It's It reminds me of this beautiful um, alchemical image of the hermaphrodite. Mm 
Mm. that is male and female joined Mm. Mm. that where the opposites are now moving together. Mm. Yeah. And and it often almost feels like they are two wings of, of a third. Yes, absolutely. There you go. That's it. Well, it's, it's, it. in, it's interesting because, um, well, as you were talking about it and we're, we're thinking about, we're talking about trust and what the function of trust is. Um, and I, I have it that when we, um, that often we will lock ourselves into something because of our mistrust, because like, okay, at least I'm mm-hmm. safe in here. We're right. looking for that safety. But one of the big questions that I, I, the, my final question, my final, final question that I came out of the golden cage with when I was first writing it, when I was writing it was what, let's say they do find something in that cage. Let's say there was something valuable Mm -hmm. that the myth of that cage was true. What do they find? And what they find is each other. Mm -hmm. And, and, And we find each other caught caught in, 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 in the, in the ambition or, 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 or caught in the thing. And then the, the big treasure, if we can trust is that we find each other and that we can connect with each other. So it, it, I, that's what I've finally come to, to, to see the Mm -hmm. golden cage as is, is that, that web that we do get caught in and yet Mm -hmm. in which we can help each other out of the one thing, you know, we can't get out of ourselves because we need someone else to reach in and we need to reach back. Otherwise it doesn't unlock. And that, that I have it. I mean, that's what I've, I've come to think. Um, but I also hear what you're saying about this, the, you know, the, I'm a, the, the, a, you know, what's the difference between a kennel and a backyard for a dog? A kennel is smaller. You can't get out, but a backyard is a place of freedom and it's a place where you're, where you're locked in. Um, so, so back to this question um, and, and, and those of you who are watching, if you're watching live, um, you on some of the channels, you can actually chat with us. So if you have a question or if you have a comment, you know, please feel free to do that. Mm-hmm. So um, back to this question, the function of trust. And if we did not have that trust as a child, if we did not get that between age zero and one, mm-hmm. zero and two, what can we do? And maybe you already answered this, but I'm going to keep asking it and probably keep asking it for years. What do we, what do we do to get it? Because I have it that we don't even need, it doesn't even need to be rational. It's trust is like it because trust and distrust that they're, they're based on something that happened in the past. What if something, if it's what happened to you between one and two determines whether you are living in trust or distrust, yeah, I mean, it, the answer, the simple answer to your question is you get yourself a good therapist, analyst, or in a good treatment program or 12 step program. <laughs> I mean, in other words, I, I always say to people, relate wounds that are created in relationship have to be healed in relationship, which I think is maybe a piece of, of what you're saying about that and the musical. It's when the characters come together and they reach right. to each other, right. Right. that transformation happens. So relationship wounds have to be healed in relationship. And um, every now and again, someone gets lucky enough to stumble upon a mentor or an intimate partner or a close friend where that can happen outside mm-hmm. of a formal healing relationship. But more often than not, there comes a point, a level of it that needs to be addressed in a very specific relationship geared for that, like analysis. Um, you know, the other thing I want to say in terms of an attitude we can cultivate is Jung is very clear that the one one-sidedness of any attitude is what creates neurosis. And so we see in both Althea and Boris, well, let's just stick with Althea for a minute. At the start of the musical, Althea has caught in a very one-sided attitude. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is, she is on this extreme end of being the victim, being woe is me, every day's the same, I'm locked in, it's cement and stone. There's no, she's caught in really a tunnel vision where she doesn't see all the other possibilities. Boris comes along because of his ambition for the golden cage, and he knows all the other possibilities. And so if we look at them as two parts of ourself, some part of ourself can show up that knows Hmm. these other possibilities. It's as if it's been sent as a messenger of the larger psyche we are, 
to say, wait a minute, there are other possibilities. So one of the things we can do on our own is really be aware of where are we one-sided and where is another option presenting itself that maybe I want to entertain, that maybe I want to dialogue with that maybe I want to talk to someone I trust about or some risk exploring with someone else. I'm going to pull up this comment um, yeah. because I think it's relevant. I mean, it's all of the comments are relevant. Um, I often think of the ultimate way to trust is trusting the process. Mm -hmm. Even though I don't know the outcome yet, I trust the process enough that it would lead me to the outcome I seek. And yeah. trusting that if things don't work out, I will be okay. Yeah. That's beautiful. And, you know, it's really yeah. interesting, Kathleen, because you were talking about a dialogue. And I think that is exactly what the Golden Cage started as. It mm -hmm. started as a dialogue between these two. Yeah. And our and the, the person who shared this comment for us with us, what you're saying to us is you have an attitude. There's a part of you that recognizes that what you with your ego thinks isn't the whole, that there's a process of unfolding that's happening. And you're going to trust that process of unfolding, even if it doesn't work out the way your ego attitude thinks it should. And I do think this is part of how we can live fully is, is, and again, I think we see this in the musical with Althea when she says, push me, push me. And Boris then does, you know, there's a trust in this process that's unfolded between them. And you're absolutely right to in that trust. There's something that's trusting again. Um, our, your comment here, you trust that. And what is it we yeah. trust? Parts of us aren't trustworthy. I mean, let's just face it. And there are people in the world who aren't trustworthy. And and sooner or later, even the people who are more trustworthy than not will fail us. That's just the way life happens. You know? Yeah, but the thing, that, the thing that blows me away is that Boris is not trustworthy to himself or her. And yet, because of the trust they have, it still works out. And that's the thing that just blows me away. Well, but he's not trustworthy from an ego point of view. But if we're looking at it as they're both parts of the larger cell that are, are an expression of the instinctive drive for wholeness, he has a valid trustworthy point. There's a big world out there and you can fly. <laughs> right. now, now, how he goes about presenting that and some of his motives for it might be deceptive. I but see. He has a valid point that that is what's trustworthy, that seed of the truth. I'm always saying to analysis and the people I work with in the embodiment circle is you want to look for what is the seed of the truth and that attitude that's coming up. And that I was with someone yesterday who was talking about an attitude she'd gotten into about something that's happening in her primary relationship. And she was going to dismiss it as an extreme. And I said, well, now let's wait a minute. Let's look at what is the truth of that statement? You know, because the, there is a truth, but it's not the absolute truth. And so anyway, I, I, I think, I think that there is a piece of force that's trustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I mean, I, I know we have to end in like two minutes. And one of the things that's so fascinating to me that you're saying um, is, is that mistrust is a wound and a wound can be healed. And it reminds me of uh, one of the first plays that I wrote was a, um, about Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was, who was a doctor and a philosopher and a thinker. And one of his quotes was, I, I, um, I, I wrapped whatever I, I, I did something to his wounds but God healed it, healed them. Um, so I dressed his wounds, but God healed them. And, you know, the process of healing is something that is so, um, it's a process and you, you, you can do things, but you can't do the healing. And yes. so, Yes. And so um, it's interesting to me to, I would love to talk about trust again, just because it's so powerful. And I see that it's, it's the foundation of this play, which means it's the foundation of my life without knowing it. And I see how it can, it either allows us to transform or, or, or makes it that we're not going to transform whether we have trust or not. Yes. And I mean, yes, I, I think maybe for our next, um, our next se session, we can talk about, um, trusting, how do we trust the process of transformation? You know, how do we trust our own mm. process of unfoldment? 
Mm -hmm. Because that's what we're talking about, is being willing to trust our process of unfoldment, which as you know from all you've done with the golden cage, and I know from things I'm doing in my life, mm -hmm. is always sometimes uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. If we're really, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. uncomfortable for Althea at first to think about coming out of the cage, much less stepping out. It was, un you, you know. Right, and, and so, then she literally faced death yeah. in, on the way to transformation. Yeah, huh? mm -hmm. yeah. And, and the, the paradox is we do die. Our sense of who we are and the way we've been in the world does change, which is death. And so people get very locked in trying to prevent themselves from changing because it's comfortable to stick with the familiar. Okay. On that note, which is very, <laughs> it's, it's very much personal to me. Um, thank you everybody for joining us for this conversation. And Kathleen, thank you for being willing to go to these places. Mm -hmm. We don't even know we're going to go to. <laughs> yeah. And and I feel like yeah. this is such a risk, uh, such a rich one. And I look forward to coming back. Um, yeah. And I'm just going to read one final thing yeah. um, that somebody just um, shared with us, I think we can choose not to trust the character of someone, but maybe they can still have interesting ideas that open up new doors for us. Absolutely. Beautiful. Okay. I'll pull our caption back on and um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kathleen. And we'll look forward to seeing all of you again next week on Jung at Harp. <laughs>